And uh, let me just say, I miss you guys, love you, and uh, pray that God is strengthening you and blessing you in this season where we are uh, finding ourselves uh, a little bit uh, in a chaotic state. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, uh, for those of you online, let me just tell you, we have a few in the group. Uh, of course, it takes several to, to put on the live streaming, and uh, I have to ask maybe when somebody comes back in, they can kind of sit in the middle. That way I can look at somebody, right? Got a few over there, a few over here. We need a balance. Well, I do want to welcome you and, uh, and just trust that, that God is at work in your life and that uh, you are sensing his leading every day, amen, in your prayer time, in your time of fellowship with the Lord, in your time in the word. Boy, we need the guidance of the Lord, don't we? He's the light, the truth, the way. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet. I wouldn't want to live life without the guidance of the word of God. And so let me encourage you to just uh, be in prayer and be in the word. Amen. Principalities and Christianity. Psalms 2. I want to begin there. Why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Boy, if there was ever kind of a, a mantra for fallen humanity, Psalms 2 might sum it up. We have a long history of those that would go against God, beginning with Cain and his line, his descendants, the Tower of Babel, all these things. Man struggles, if I can use that word, uh, with the authority of God, with his rule in their life. And the word of God says that they even take counsel together. They plot and they scheme. How can we silence God? How can we get out from under the authority of God? That's what the psalmist writes and prophesies and we read today and if you look into world history you can certainly uh, echo that with a resounding yes can't you yes it, it does make sense that is man's bent and man's problem we want to tie this into the book of acts because this part of this passage was quoted um, that we're going to read today in the book of acts what was happening in the early church how did the world respond I want to look at that question uh, as we look at Psalms 2 and, and how they quoted that. How did the world respond? How did the rulers of the world respond? Was it, yes, yes, tell me more? Jesus, you said you're the bread of life. Oh, I want that message. Tell me more. Was it that? Did the world say, oh, Jesus, you said you're the light of the world. Tell me more. Or was it rather, as Jesus said, that men love the darkness rather than the light? What can we learn? What can we learn? And how can this impact us, you and I, today? So we want to look at Acts uh, chapter 4, 23 through 31. We'll get there in just a minute. It's in this passage that we have recorded uh, the, dis the, the disciples, the apostles' response uh, to some pretty serious resistance in the church. And uh, in today's age that we find ourselves living in, uh, we can learn a lot from their example. How did they respond? How did they respond? One thing is we know they didn't back down, right? Uh, we read that. 
We read that. They didn't back down. Uh, but we're also going to read of their worship, of their reflection of the work of God and of, uh, on the world and, and within his church. So the question that I want to put before you today is when the principalities and the powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and the spiritual hosts of wickedness came against the church and tried to silence the message and tried to scatter the work of God, what was the response of the Christians, the early Christians? Because obviously we'll want to respond the same way, amen? Because you will agree with me that the revelation of Jesus Christ is still under attack. The revelation of Jesus Christ that, he, that God has given through his son is still trying to be silenced in the world and controlled. I want to uh, talk a little bit about the context of this passage. And, and of course, we're, we're kind of been here for a few weeks, but uh, remember that a great miracle had been done. A lame man that was over 40, uh, Peter and John said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He walked, he, he leaped, he praised God. He was a worshiper, he was a man of faith. And, uh, you know, if you're like me, sometimes questions go through your mind. And, and uh, you know, I, I was wondering, as Peter and John were walking into the temple and they saw this lame man, what was it that led them just to speak to him directly and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk? And, of course, we would answer that and say it was the leading of the Spirit, amen, and how important it is to be led of the Spirit, to hear where the Spirit is leading. I, I wouldn't want to do that on my own initiative, right? I would want God to be leading me, and that's what was happening in the lives of the apostles. But remember that a great miracle had, done, had been done. It gave opportunity for the message to be proclaimed because many people were gathering to, around them. And don't forget this, that people were coming to Christ. That means they were coming to Christ, means they were believing in Jesus. They were repenting of their sins. They were turning from their sins to Christ, to God. They were being reconciled to a holy God. Man is, is at schism with God apart from Christ, but in Christ, as they believe, uh, there's a gift of righteousness. There's forgiveness of sins. These men were uh, converted, and the beautiful thing about this picture of the early church is that they were uh, they were showing us how to love God and how to love people. It's a it's an incredible thing that to to witness uh, the nature of 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 true sacrificial living and and the way they loved and cared for one another. Now, just as a little bit of a side note, uh, this miracle uh, was was a catalyst to uh, an incredible opportunity to preach the gospel. And let me just say, don't be discouraged if we don't have uh, miracles of that magnitude today because God can still gather a crowd by the power of his Holy Spirit through us, amen? Because Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by your love one for another. So we don't have to look back and, and, and wring our hands and lament and say, boy, we don't see miracles like that. How can we ever see God move? God is moving through us. God is moving through our, our relationships with one another. When the world sees true love and concern, one for another, they're drawn to Christ, right? It reminds me of another scripture. If I be lifted up from the world, I will draw all people to myself. And so we, we know that was mainly fulfilled, right? Primarily fulfilled in Christ being lifted up between heaven and earth on the cross. But it's also fulfilled in us as we lift up Jesus Christ. And if we're faithful to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, God will be faithful to draw people to Christ. Amen? Amen. We lift him up, the all-sufficient Savior. And, and again, we have a miracle, we have an opportunity, a door open for the preaching of the gospel, then we have conflict. Psalms 2. Psalms 2, why did the nations rage? Why did the people plot a vain thing? We have a miracle, we have an opportunity, we have the preaching, and then we have conflict, which we're going to read about in just a minute, but in particular, with the religious leaders of all things. It's the last thing you would expect, right? The religious leaders. 
It's the last thing that you would expect in the day of Christ. One thing to note about the religious leaders of Jesus' day is just to note that they were connected with political power. Rome. Rome. Their seat of authority was empowered by Rome. That's the reality of it. The religious leaders in Jerusalem, their power and their seat of authority was uh, empowered by Rome. And so it's natural for them to have an earthly or a carnal focus. And in a word, the problem here that we have with the religious leaders of Jesus' day is they, they had become political. And, and I mean that in the sense of all the negative things that we associate with the word political. Politics is not always a bad thing, but when you say the word political, uh, you kind of know where that leads to, and often it's, it has negative connotations. Everything that was negative about politics was, was associated with these religious leaders of the day. And so when Jesus came and he worked miracles and he taught the revelation of God and the heart of God and he demonstrated love and compassion for uh, the downcast and the persecuted and the condemned, when Jesus demonstrated that, when people began to turn and be healed, the religious leaders weren't into that. Because they were thinking about how Jesus and his followers and the ministry happening would affect them in their place, the scriptures tell us. They weren't into it. Rather than receive the truth of God, they believed that they needed to stop this Jesus. Because as John records, they believed that Rome would come and take away their place and thus their power. And the obvious question, and really a rhetorical question, is were they seeking to hear from God where he was leading, or were they seeking their own interest? Right? That's really the, 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 the sentinel question about these political leaders, these religious leaders that were tied in politically to Rome. Were they seeking to hear what God was saying or were they considering their own interests? And we know the obvious answer to that. Did their politics trump truth? And so, ironically, they, they, they became the religious police, police protecting uh, the status quo and their interest, their selfish interest. And, and, and you read about them in the Gospels and you realize that they love playing the political game. Remember when... Uh, Pilate was vacillating on whether to crucify Christ. Um, They were quick to to remind Pilate, boy, Pilate, you're not a friend of Caesar unless you kill this guy who claims to be a king. And so they were very adept at playing the game. But here's what I want to say about it is that their political connection with Rome not only hindered, uh, not only hindered, but prevented them from receiving Christ. Because that was their priority. Their political connections and their trust in Rome. It not only hindered, but it prevented them from receiving Christ, which we see in their murderous activity, right? One to murder Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead. They murdered Jesus. The takeaway here is that you can't have one foot in the world and one foot with God. It doesn't work that way. You cannot play politics with the will of God. You can't ride the fence, as is often said. Either you're serving God and and listening to where God is leading, or you're playing politics and far from God. That's the message that we hear out of this context of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. you got to make your choice. Is it about this life? Is it about your status, your position, your power, your wealth? Even your political party 
Is that what it's about? Or is it about the Lord's Prayer where the Lord says, Hallowed be thy name. Is it about the name of the Lord? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is it about the kingdom of God? Is it about the will of God? A choice has to be made. And, and we really have to ask ourselves, are we trying to preserve our worldly stuff? And I'm reminded of, of the verse that Jesus said, uh, he, who finds his li- he who loses his life will find it. He who tries to hold on to it will lose it. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jesus is speaking to the condition of the religious leaders of his day. You're trying to hold on to all your stuff, your position, your power, your status, your wealth, and you're coming against the work of God in doing that. Here's an interesting just note that from history we know that when you bed politics with religious authority, you, you run into problems. We know that. We remember the pilgrims and, and uh, their, their issues and their fleeing from Europe. That was the case here. There was, this, there was this unholy wedlock. You know, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were those who wanted religion on their own terms. Now, Jesus was very direct and confrontational with the Pharisees. If you're, ever, if you're ever sleepy and you need to wake up, open up to Matthew 23, it'll wake you right up. Matthew 23 is, Jesus lays out pretty clearly the case against uh, the religious leaders. And we're speaking in general terms. There were exceptions of godly men even in the group. But uh, uh, Jesus speaks pretty directly. And it's, it's written there for our learning, isn't it? It's there for a purpose. It's there for a purpose. Jesus was confrontational with them because he knew their hearts. He knew their hearts. He knew what they were thinking. He knew that they were those who had a form of godliness but denied the power of it. They had a, a surface religion, uh, religion, but they denied the power of it to change the internal the man, to work a work of transformation of the heart. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And in that fact alone, they were very, very dangerous. And that's why Jesus went after him to expose him. Because it says, if a man were lost in the woods, not knowing where he's going, and finally he comes out and he finds somebody, and that person tells him complete opposite direction of where they need to go, right? That's where these religious leaders of Jesus' day, generally speaking, were, were at. Now, when I, I was about two or three years old, I wandered off from the camp where we were staying. I wandered off a, a long ways. And finally, I came to a trailer park. I remember climbing a fence, going to the door, knocking, and I praise God that somebody was there that took me back and, and found my parents. Amen? I wouldn't want to be wandering and then find somebody that told me the opposite way. And that's why Jesus was so hard on them because they had a form of godliness, but they denied its power. They were very, very dangerous. Just like it would be so dangerous for a child to be lost and to be found by the wrong person. So so let's look at this for a moment, this, this situation with the religious leaders. Because it's important, because Jesus prioritized it. They, re- they wanted religion on their own terms. Let me give you three things that, that, that kind of define religion on your own terms. Number one, they picked and they chose which part of the law they wanted to follow. They were excellent sorters. 
they, they had the list and they sorted and they put at the top the ones that they wanted and they de-emphasized and denied the ones at the bottom. Remember, Jesus told them, hey, you tithe mint of all these incredible small things, right? And yet you deny the weightier matters of the law. And it's kind of, it's kind of akin today when we say, you know what, I'm going to go to church, but I want what I want, right? I want to go to church, I want to sing, I want to worship, but during the rest of the week, I want what I want, and I'm going to do it my way. That's kind of making religion on our terms, isn't it? That's, that's sorting where we prioritize some and de-emphasize others. That's pharisaic, pharisaical living. That's really what that is. Religion on your own terms is sorting the law of God and prioritizing what you want and ignoring the parts that you don't. Number two, they refuse the standard of God. Now, when the Pharisees, when they reflected on their lives and how they were doing with God in relationship, they wouldn't look to the standard, the law of God. But rather, Jesus said, they would compare themselves with other people. You know what a big mistake that is? Probably, we can always find somebody that's worse than us, right? And the parable of, of the publican and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the Pharisee and the tax collector. And remember what, what the Pharisee said? God, I'm so thankful I'm not like this guy right here. They're in the same, they're in the temple praying, right? I'm so thankful that I'm not like this guy, this wretched, poor, despicable sinner. I'm not like him. So now I'm feeling pretty good about myself. That's what, that was the, the Pharisees. They, uh, they didn't measure themselves with what God was speaking, but they measured themselves by comparison. That's a huge mistake. And, and we can do the same thing today. When we just say, when we point the finger and say, look at that guy. Number three, they made it man-centric rather than God-centric. Jesus said they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's pretty, that's pretty direct. They love the praises of men more than the praises of God. In other words, they, it was about show. They wanted to look good. That is religion on your own terms. And, and we can do that even in the church when we start playing, right, politics when we start playing politics, instead of hearing what God is saying, we're putting it through a filter of how does this look. We want the will of God in the church, amen? We don't want to lead the church by public opinion polls or what makes us feel good. We want the will of God in the church. Religion on your own terms not only brings your soul in conflict with the move of God, but it's deadly. Jesus said the Pharisees were spiritually dead, but boy, they didn't look like it. They looked good from the outside. So we have this context, a great miracle, a great opportunity, and great opposition. And finally, we're going to pick it up here where the religious leaders just sent Peter and John packing and said, we forbid you in no uncertain terms, you will not speak in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's read this passage in Acts 4, 23 through 31. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, 
both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and all the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together, was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke of the word of God with boldness. Boy, if you ever wanted a formula for uh, church power uh, and church growth, it must be found there in verse 31, right? They prayed, they called out to God, God moved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God. Pretty simple formula, isn't it? Pray, wait for God to move, be filled with the Spirit and preach the Word of God and live it. What a, what a tremendous passage. And so when the principalities and the powers and the dominions and the rulers of the spiritual darkness of this age and the spiritual host of wickedness came against the disciples and the apostles, what did they do? Well, first, uh, they stood firm. Amen. They, the, when they were threatened, uh, they said, we cannot but speak the things that God has shown us. They stood firm. Number two, they gathered. They went to their own. They came together. They came together for support, to support one another, to pray for one another, to minister to one another. They came together. They worshiped. What did the early disciples, what did the apostles do in the face of resistance? They made sure they were faithful. They stood. Then they came together. Amen. They worshiped. You are God. You are creator. You are the one who has made all things. They prayed. They sought God and they reflected. And I think that's an important piece of this is that they reflected on what God's word says that what's going on in the world. This book, God's book, the Bible, gives clarity and understanding and insight into why we see the chaos in the world. And that's what they went to. They went back to the word of God to understand the context in which they were. And they reflected on God's word and God's plan. They asked for strength. Number six, they asked for strength. It's really not complicated, is it? It's gathered together with God's people in worship, in prayer, asking God to do what only God can do. Give us strength. Give us strength. Give us boldness to stand. They asked for God to move. Let there be signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. That in the name of Jesus, there would be a crowd gathered and Jesus may be preached. They essentially were asking God, create another gathering. Amen? Create another gathering, Lord. Pull people together that we may proclaim the word of God, that we may pro preach Jesus, that we may preach Jesus as the only way. And they stood. So just uh, consider that as we close. Here is the order of, that God has laid out for the church in times of resistance and times where there's pressure to back away from the message. He's called us to stand. Do not stop sharing what God has given you. Do not stop showing or sharing what God has showed you. Gather together with the people of God. Worship and pray and reflect. Reflect. Reflect on the season and the times that you're in, and that what God is doing. And absolutely seek God for his strength. Cry out for his move. Cry out for his move within you and around you. Cry out for those opportunities that you may proclaim the word of God boldly. And when we go, by God's grace, we will stand. Can you say amen? Worship team, would you come?